Well, hello everyone and welcome to our weekly gathering of IOs, HR recruiters, and all of us who like to help people in business, including one actor, Jeremy. Here we are once again, the start of a brand new year. And we're going to start by talking about building influence at work. We are. And I've got some interesting things that I was able to find research wise. And I have some guiding, not principles, but guiding subtopics that we can go over in terms of building influence. I found a couple of studies. And one interesting study was about, it was called a phenomenal. Phenomenal, phenomenological, 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 say that 20 times, uh, qualitative study of about 57 people. Basically, what do they see as influence at work? There's a lot of research out there and a lot of quantitative data that shows the benefits of being able to have influence at work, whether it's in terms of belonging, whether it's in terms of your task, whether it's in terms of relationships. So I have three separate articles that I'll share in the chat and they'll all should be also be in the show notes um for the podcast show notes so you can access them i did find i do i do have an article that i was able to find on that's available everywhere i found it on um uh google scholar so everyone will be able to access that which also means i'm going to pull up an image from that today since it's accessible to everyone that provides some some guidance for today so Tom, while I prepare my screens, thinking when you were thinking about today's topic, our minds go to different places. When you think about influence at work, what do you, what what does that mean to you? Well, you know, my experience with a lot of organizations is that it's leadership who needs training. So if I can have influence with that leader, I discover that I can actually do a little leadership training, um, you know, not by going, hey, you don't know what you're doing, but hey, maybe this will work or have you considered this? And so if I can build that influence with leadership, I can actually have an effect on the overall organization or at least the team. Yes, that's excellent. And a quick check because I see the swirling thing. Is my mic on? Yeah. Okay, because I'm I'm frozen, but if you guys can hear me. So there is one of the, I always try to find a variety of different kinds of articles to look at practical implications in the workplace. And there's one I found about humor at work and whether or not hum, using humor as a leader is actually good to help build influence and while you're trying to build your, your leadership skills. So we'll have some practical implications and we'll also have some actual things. I'll go ahead and get started with, providing just a little bit of information from some of these articles just to get our minds going. So there was one study that I found, it was published in June of 2022 from the Nordic Journal of Working Life Studies. It's called Influence at Work Tied to Materi Materiality in Danish Care Work. So I want to I'm going to start off with this to just broaden our perspective. And by materiality, they mean the environment in terms of just how the buildings are designed, really. So we start off with um, looking at the literature review and we look at, you know, for such a long time, we look at influence. Did Jeremy just disappear? <laughs> it looks that way. Oh, there. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Lee, I'd actually love to go to you because, you know, when I talk about having, you know, not being in leadership, but having influence that I might be able to affect the leadership, I'm, I'm really interested in what you've seen in the military and how that can actually play out. Is it, can it work? Uh, <clears throat> from my experience, that to some extent it has to, um, you know, the military is obviously more striated than than industry, you know, with with definite levels of uh, you know, your job. Like, you know, the more junior, you know, your enlisted types you, are your technicians. They're doing the the nuts and bolts stuff while you get up into the officers, and they're doing uh, you know more more command and you know, uh, you know strategic as opposed to tactical type stuff. And so when you get to the senior enlisted ranks in between. Um, you're kind of that bridge. And, uh, you know, I can't speak for those services, but in the Navy, 
uh, you know, when you're when you're promoted to to chief, which is the you know the first level of the senior NCO ranks, you're told that your job is part of your job is to train junior officers, and so you have to do that because I mean obviously they outrank you, so you have to to do that in a delicate manner and very you know correctly for it to be effective. And sometimes, depending on the officer in question, you have to do it in a way that they don't realize they're being trained. So you have to to use more influence and uh, you know the the lead the horse the walk to water kind of thing so that you can give them uh, give them their own idea so that you know when you lead them to it and all of a sudden they go I have a great idea and you're like that's fantastic great idea even though it's where you were trying to get them to go to start with um, so it is it is a delicate tap dance sometimes but you know like you know the tam dancing in the in the you know minefield kind of thing but it's crucial because if you don't they have no idea i mean you you, you consider you know your officers you know your a lot of your very very junior officers have just come out of college they've never had uh you know much in the way of uh, of employment and now we're putting them in charge of things that could affect people's you know very lives as well as you know millions of dollars worth of equipment and you know they have some of them have no idea and so you have to to uh to work that to give them that idea to understand that they have people's lives in their hands and that sort of thing and it, it's uh, sometimes a challenge especially when you get you know some old bristle guy like me who's trying to deal with a you know a 24 year old who thinks that they're you know everything because they got that commission and you know, it's it, it can be challenging, and uh, you know, very degrees of success, obviously. <laughs> Good to hear. At least it's working. You know, some ways, uh, Linda, and I'd love to go to you because you know, spending time in the HR field, how much does influence play? Whether it's from someone who is, you know, a worker bee trying to influence leadership, or leadership trying to influence you know, the general staff, how much of a role does influence play? I think it plays a, a, a huge piece because if you don't have the factors in place that um, can create influence, then it's going to fall on deaf ears and, and not really go anywhere. So I think it's really important to have the factors that create the influence in place and, um, and work on developing those pieces in order to create the influence. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. But, but now, <laughs> Dr. Martha, I want to go to you with like, so how do I do that? <laughs> how do I start to build, you know, my influence in an organization? Is is there a roadmap to doing that? Oh, I absolutely think so. Whether you know, your position within the organization really doesn't make that much of a difference when we're talking about influence because we're talking about human beings relating to one another and trying to persuade them of something or convince them of something. So there are so many different components to that. We talked about things like uh, branding, personal branding, that will go into it. Your reputation will go into it. Um, your everyday behavior, which is what influences your reputation and your personal brand, that goes into it. It's about building relationships with people because if you don't have a relationship with someone, even if it's a, a perceived relationship, not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one type of relationship, but they, they know who you are they know what you're made of, they know what you stand for, then in some sense, that's a relationship. If you don't have that, whatever you're trying to do is likely to fall on deaf, deaf ears. Um, you know, you have to know what you're talking about, whatever it is that you're trying to influence in regards to, you really need to be an expert on something. Because if you're just talking fluff, it's not going to go far. You may get a, away with it once or twice, but people will catch up. And then your attempts of influencing will 
become null and void, if you will, right? You have to, um, you have to listen to people. You have to be willing to take their feedback. You have to be willing to promote their ideas so that you are seen as someone trustworthy, as someone who's in it for the whole rather than for yourself. So things like language matter. Use less of the word I and more of the word we, right? So talk about how is this going to be good for everybody, not how is this going to benefit me? People will respond much better to that. Even things like body language and tone of voice will make a big difference. So there are definite guidelines that one can embrace when attempting to influence. Um, you know, we have nowadays we have these people called influencers all over social media right they're doing something right they figured it out if they have all these followers it can't be that hard right so it's a matter of really paying attention to what you're doing what you're trying to sell and i think the more genuine you are the more connected you are with the other people the better your relationship is with them, the better your reputation, your brand, the better of a chance you have at actually um, successfully influencing people. And don't abuse that power either, because sometimes once people gain some kind of um, power, such as influence, it might go to their head or they want to overuse it. Don't, don't overdo that. You know, it's, it's um, I like to think of it as a gift and use it as needed. Yeah, and if you overuse it, you're right. You, you will lose that gift. Uh, <laughs> it will become non-special anymore. Uh, Jeremy, I think you're back with us. I am. And is it unheard of to have tech difficulties? I mean, it's 2023. So <laughs> what's, what's going on there? Uh, uh, Tom, can you just give me a brief where did I leave off at? Because I think that I was talking for quite a while, probably to myself. You were, I think you were just about to show us um, some of the research you've gotten maybe from the Nordic people. Ah, yes. So in, in general, so I did put some, re some of the references and I put an image in the, in the chat. But as far as that Nordic study, it was, it was, it was interesting because they found that uh, even people would have influence and they had, um, they looked at different environments, even in terms of just having glass, glass see-through walls and how that actually helped people have better influence over the design of their tasks and that kind of thing, because it opened up that particular psychosocial space. So when we look at influence, the goal for sharing that for me is to get to, to really widen our perspective in terms of how we're looking at what influence means and, and how it's important. And one of the, I may be repeating here, but one of the biggest what's, you know, ROIs, the whole what's in it for me as an organization uh, research shows that low control at work combined with high demands is associated with serious health outcomes like cardiovascular disease, depression, stress, and long-term sick leave. And what company doesn't want to reduce stress in the, in the workplace and long-term sick leave? So again, this is why it's important to teach, uh, you know, how to have a you know, positive influence in the workplace and in, in employee communication courses and leadership development, leadership development training, and one-on-one and -on -one coaching, because that's an important part. So what I want to pull up now, I'll get to, I'll get to that study in a second regarding the using using humor. I did put it in the chat. So everyone does have this image. And now I'm going to share my screen because I think this is something that's that can be very helpful. And good, everyone can see. Uh, something that can be very helpful in terms of guiding our discussion today. Now, this is what I was mentioning with it was a the the study of the uh, the fifty seven individuals. This qualitative information. What are the types of influence here? We can see on the left, and then the consequences of the type of influence. But really, when we if we after we just start to digest this and we start to look at this, we can start to say, where do we start? Because in these conversations that we have, it's it's always important for me to have action items, to be able to have, have people be able to start to break things down so that they can focus on one chunkable, uh, viable task or viable concept or thought at a time, and then create action items out of that. So when we talk about building influence in the workplace, 
I look at it as how do we break these down? So if I'm an individual or if I'm a, a team leader, whatever it may be, how do I build influence to solve tasks, to prioritize tasks, to uh, build influence and be able to exchange views and knowledge? How do I build influence to have a voice? And as you can see, I'm simply just reading down these particular bullet points because this is this is data that we have which is good because now we have, again, we're talking about IO psychology. So we're looking at the studies and the results, which give us great information. So we can start to say, all right, here are my buckets, performing, belonging, becoming, identity, relations, and work tasks. So now I start to have buckets. So for example, if I'm in, if, if I'm the, you know, uh, direct director of uh, learning and development, I might say, okay, this is something that our, up and coming supervisors are lacking is being able to have influence and being able to properly get buy-in and properly have conversations, especially with leaderships when they're invited to sit at the table. Maybe we'll develop some kind of a program. And it looks like, because this is data, here are some buckets that we could focus on. And we even have some bucket items here that we could focus on in terms of development. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, this is why the, the field of IO psychology is so exciting, so important for organizations, and also so very helpful because we can start to break down and we can make the workplace and the workplace environment better and the everyday experience of our employees better. So I'll keep this up for just a, a moment and then everyone can refer to the file that I, I posted this file in the chat because these are talking points. People might share an idea on how do we build influence in terms of um, making sure that we're focusing on the most important and urgent task, for example, or being how do we build influence in terms of being a legitimate part of going on. So in that regard, this can help guide our conversation. We have the what, and we can talk now about the how. Tom? Tom? Uh, great, great information. And uh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. So Brendan, let's go to you. So I wanted to go back to what uh, Dr. Martha was saying within this idea of building influence and just a strategy that I've pursued is that when you work as an external consultant, building influence is part of your job. If you want to get buy-in from people and actually do your job, you're going to have to, I don't want to say politics, but you're going to have to know who you're going to have to gain trust of, who's going to work on your team, and, and you need to have them know that you're reliable. So there's no reason for that to only be external. And even if you're not calling yourself an internal consultant, you still should be function as an internal consultant, especially with these IO psychology jobs, HR type jobs, you have to be able to speak to people in multivariate departments um, to make sure that you're fulfilling their needs for whatever they want. Obviously, this comes in a lot with uh, organizational development sorts of projects where if you're trying to help it or change management even, where you're trying to change something about the organization, develop something about the organization, and you need to find out who the key players are, it's not only knowing that the key players are there, but it's also having the key players having your back on whatever you are working on, rather than having them drag their feet against your change. So it is very much taking that external consultant mindset and developing it internally as well. Do you find like all the various things that Dr. Martha talked about, do you find in the work that you're doing that there's, you know, one of those skills like people skills that, you know, you're a superhero at? Do you have <laughs> like communication or, or one of those types of skills? Sure. I think the biggest one that I fall back on is definitely with the study that Jeremy was saying, it's humor. It, making people laugh is always going to get a connection to them. And then they just naturally want to be around you because they don't want to miss the punchline. Right. Does it help to be a nice guy? Like, can, can that, if it goes to, to an extreme, you can be taken advantage of, but is it important to get people to like you? I don't think it's about, this is going to sound weird, but it's not about being nice. It's about being helpful. So if somebody asks you to do something, you don't wait three days to do it for them if you have the time to do it. 
This way, they don't have to chase you down for things. When you get known as the person that needs to be chased down, people don't like sending you emails then because then they'll just go, I'll just do it myself. Very, very true. <laughs> Linda Ann, let's go to you. I think this is such an interesting um, topic to me. One of the things that when you look at that list, that left side of the list that Jeremy has put up there, the type of influence and, and the work tasks, look at what it says is that employee experiences influence when they have a say in how to solve tax tasks, how to prioritize, et cetera. How do you get to the point where you're having this interaction where the employee is experiencing that? And for me, the way to do that is to ask them questions and have them tell me information right, and communicate with me. And that's how I will have the interaction to help them, allow them to solve the task. You know, you can pose a question to them and, and see what their answer is. And then they feel like they're having um, input into the process. And then when they go to do that task, they're far more bought in to the result from that task. So and I learned this very long ago, and it's a very old book, and I know it's not scientific, but the process of questioning people and then actively listening to them is, you know, Dale Carnegie. It was the, you know, how to win friends and influence people. And I hate the title of that. But when I talk to young people going into business, that's one book I said, if there's only one you can read, read that one because it really drives home the point of having genuine interest in someone, listening to them and creating that relationship and that interaction. You also learn what motivates people. And if you wanna influence people, you have to understand their motivations, so. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. And, you know, I, I <laughs> you know, being a voice and speech guy and working with people to do presentations, um, I'll often say to people is, you know, read Dale Carnegie's book first and then come see me because it's got a lot of really good information and then we're not starting on page one. Uh, Dr. Martha, let's go to you. So as this conversation unfolds, we're hearing a lot of good ideas and a lot of good suggestions here. And one thing that I'm thinking about and kind of makes me chuckle in the back of my mind is that somebody out there listening thinking, oh, I'm going to take all these tips and influence the heck out of people. Well, word of caution, <laughs> if, if your reputation is shot, or if you're that dictator at work, or if you're the jerk everybody in, uh, uh, you know, avoids, you're not going to have much luck. So going back to the What's your reputation? What are your relationships like? You can tell, take all the tips here that we're providing and we're providing some excellent ideas with the group here, but you really need to have good relationships with people, good people skills, because otherwise people just look at you and they, they might give you lip service, but that's about as far as it'll go. So you can't be that evil dictator and thinking, ah, this episode will turn it all around. It won't. Yeah, so true. I mean, people people think that they can do videos because we all have computers with cameras and mics. Everybody can do videos, but you might not be doing effective videos <laughs> unless you. And all those influencers, they understand that and they've got it down. Uh, and Manny, let's go to you. What? <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll have I'd love to say that um, thank you for this experience, Jeremy, and everyone who's working with you. Uh, this experience has made me grow in so many ways that most of you can't even see. But me, I live to celebrate my wins, my small wins every day. <laughs> so with that said, um, you know, uh, I love the pop-ups you had last time. Dr. Martha, thank you for all the knowledge. <laughs> It really helped in the IO psychology. And then Jeremy, the first time I'm, I was in a cohort and he talked about um, 
saying what some what what those people are thinking you know it gets always gets their attention and then tom you teaching me how to talk from my stomach up you know my voice to be heard a little bit that was also incredible but then um uh, that there um i've got to say as well that i always love using examples you know because i'm not so much experienced but i love using examples because people kind of like relate more with examples so when i was saying all these i kind of like a little bit caught on almost everyone i said attention somehow you know and um with these examples you kind of like relate somehow you know and then with re with relating with these examples there comes you know feeling hard and understood so what i'm saying the how do we do this influence because i also had dr martha talking about the influencers that we have on social media i i have almost i'm on the lucky i have accounts across all these social medias i have account on tiktok and all but one thing i've seen that people skill i've seen that really works uh within even my experience is going to be um an active listening which is remembering remembering is almost everything and i'll give another example which is a C the crms client relations management all these people who are kind of like marketing they just want to have something on their clients that when they go into pitch they will pitch in with something and then somebody's like oh you remember and I feel like these are, this is the same skill we use out there in relationships, personal relationships, friends, whether even in marriage. Somebody who remembers, you remember the anniversary, it sweeps you off their feet and you just wanna keep you know, doing something what, for somebody. So with remembering as leaders in organizations, whatever you have, whatever detail you could get on somebody, it starts with conversation, how are you doing? They'll tell you. From there will be those who will be open. They will tell you. And then next time you meet them, oh, so and so, how, how is this going? Just two minutes thing. They'll be like shocked, you remember? And they will always want to keep in your loop. You're influencing. They will feel hard. They will feel understood. You know, they will feel remembering. Remembering is almost everything. I see it being used in CRMs. I'm seeing it being used on social media. These people come on and they will talk about whatever they wanna influence people on. Their next session of them coming on, they will speak on something. They're like, oh yeah, so like last time we did this, this and that, and somebody will be following. You're remembering what you talked to about before I'm following, and then I'm always gonna come back to, to, your, to your channel because I know you're taking me step by step. It's a language anybody can understand. I hardly saying that, um, his order relating to young kids. There is always this one language, empathy and all this active listening, remembering it speaks language to the old, to the young. And there you go with all the generation, generation X, even, um, and I've, I've only, I'm only speaking like this because I've used it so much where I'm, I'm in my emotional support. I just started throwing up, I, I usually pull up the little reports we do on these people. And then they, Imani, do you remember me? I don't remember them, but I'm going to pull up the information. I'm like, yeah, I, I remember you. Last time we talked, we talked about this. And they're so ecstatic. And there goes the conversation. I'm influencing, as in as leaders, let's learn this um, skill and then influencing this. Because when you remember, and even the reason why I keep coming back to these sessions, I was shocked when I just saw my name somewhere on the podcast. They remembered me. I was on the podcast. They put me somewhere. I'm like, I'm always going to go to this podcast. I'm into this um, Zoom meeting. I want to even subscribe to the membership because remembering is everything. That's what I just wanted to say. I hope I haven't taken much of your time, but that's a skill I just wanted to put out there that we almost underlook, that almost every influencer salesman use because they have the CRMs that they use to run data on this, you know, their clients. Yeah, yes. I think I think you're absolutely right. You make some really good points. Like, you know, if you can tell stories, people love stories. And um, Maria, I'll come to you in a second. I just want to jump back to Jeremy quickly because she uh, because Amani also remind me of, of Jeremy. Like 
your when you say that leadership really needs to get onto the factory floor and have those open conversations with those frontline employees. And if you approach them and go, hey, Sid, how are you doing? Uh, if you remember their name, it just connects you so well. Tom, names are names are very important. And even in our, our momentum sessions that we do for our members, our biweekly sessions, I'll even because I'm not I'm not the best at just using names. So I'll actually say I'm going to go around the room so everyone hears their name. I'll just say it out loud. Just tell what I'm doing. And it's I, you know, it still has that impact. But I always like to call people out by name. The other thing with with calling people out by names, and this is coming from somebody who has the worst name memory ever. If I haven't seen you in like three days, I'll say, hey, you, because I just am afraid that I'll forget your name. But in meetings, one of the most effective things that I've that I've just done is in the middle and towards the end of meetings, I'll be that. And I encourage people to just to try this. Maybe it's your style, but it's helpful to find to be that spider web, I call it, and pull everyone's ideas together. You might have six people in a room and it's so it's 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 awesome to be able to it's a good feeling. But you see the the reaction from everyone and finally the clarity, because you'll say, Look, Jim had this idea and it tied really well into Sharon's point about this and what we can come up with based on the support from and just calling those people the the names out. Yes, that that is very important. Um Tom, yes, I'm going to turn it back over to you for Maria. And then after Maria, I have more to say. All right, Maria, let's go to you. Thank you. I won't be too long. Um, just to, I, I know Lee mentioned this in the chat, and to piggyback on what Dr. Martha said, um, these are all great ideas, right? And we can all benefit from everything that everyone has discussed here. And we're not going to be foolish enough to try to implement them all at once. But I think, you know, in addition to what Lee has mentioned, vulnerability is extremely important as a leader and also as someone who's trying to get the leader's attention. Um, we may get the lip service that, you know, they'll try our change, but we have to follow up on that. We have to check in with them if nothing has happened and say, you know, was it the idea itself that isn't getting any movement? Is there something that we can do differently to get this started? Is there a part of the idea that you don't appreciate um, in this particular context? So not letting it get cold, if you will, but without being an egg, you know, and I will say that, you know, self-reflection is probably the biggest thing that I am hopefully working on in 2023 uh, for the simple reason that my passion is so great. I can come across as a professional nag and who, who likes a nag? A nag is a nag regardless of what you put before it. Um, so definitely, I, I think vulnerability in a proactive manner is also, I think, helpful in, in many cases. Not all cases, but many cases. Uh, let me ask you, Maria, is, is that not a hard sell, though, for leadership is you have to be vulnerable? What? <laughs> well, I don't think you have to tell leadership that they need to be vulnerable. I think you can... You can coach leadership, if you will, um, in ways to get rapport going where they do become vulnerable because when you're asking a question, you are being vulnerable. So even if they say, well, I, I don't think this will work because of A, B, and C, do you have an idea for that? You know, so I think helping leadership, you know, not feel, you know, um, vulnerable, if you will, because they feel the vulnerability may be a weakness, um, but teaching them that by explaining or asking further questions rather than dismissing an idea might get them more leverage in the long run. Yeah, keep asking those questions. It's a great way to get things going. Uh, Jeremy, let's hop back to you and then Nick will come to you. Something you mentioned too, and I, I think about I think about this often, you mentioned about, and we talk about a lot going and, and uh, just really having conversations with people. I'm moving farther and farther away from the idea, and this is a lot of people are going to think I'm crazy. I'm moving farther and farther away from the idea that um, the general conversations that are the easiest starters are the best ones. I really think that simple things like how was your weekend and how was your day? I think they're, I, I don't think they're beneficial. So I'm going to just add a point of clarification just in terms of my own perspective. I don't think those things are beneficial because it's so easy for people to say, good. 
it was good we did xyz and then it really just becomes the extension of a formality no more different than hey how you doing good when you pass someone in a hall or, or talking on the elevator i really think it's more beneficial to ask more poignant questions even like uh like what maria was just saying and by the way quick note uh, Maria has enormous experience with operations and just immense knowledge. And you can check out her LinkedIn profile and see the, the field that she's in. And I encourage any IOs to connect with her, especially IOs that are up and coming without some of that uh, straight work experience that are coming right out of academia. She can provide so much knowledge. All right. There's my little, little, little bracket there. So thank you for being here, Maria, by the way. And I, I think it's so something that she mentioned is we're experiencing a problem with this. What are some of the options that you com can come up with? Or even asking a more significant question like, "What was what was the what were you looking forward forward to this weekend, and did it come true?" Or what was one of the what was one of the shining moments that gave you fulfillment? Or what do you wish you would have done this weekend that you didn't? Just something to get them talking a little more. It, it goes back to the the difference between someone who's upset and you say, why are you leaving? And they say, because I can or because I want to versus what do you hope to achieve by going? You can't just get away with saying because I can. It's it, something that what requires a thoughtful response response and the mindset of this comes out of you're done with the presentation. Tom, you know, Tom, we spend Tom, you and I spend so much time together. I'm a broken record with you. And sometimes I feel bad because you have to hear these things over and over, but they're worth repeating. Um, at the end of a presentation, any questions? Were, I, I think that that's just one of the, unless you just want to get the heck out of there. I think that's one of the worst things you can say because everyone else wants to get the heck out of there. And they think that if they speak up, everyone's going to get mad because they want to go get lunch. So saying What's one question or comment that you can think of that you might think of later and you wish you would have asked? And then just maybe make eye contact. Tom, you, you know, I, I do this all the time. And just either make eye contact or if it's a Zoom, just do quick round robin. Uh, yes, no, pass. And usually we get some of the most important comments out of that. Because again, we're talking about building influence at work. And going back to what Imani said is say what other people are, are thinking and we have to also start to understand what people are thinking by giving them the floor. And I don't know where I heard this, but somebody once said, and if you look at it, it's in movies all the time, the most, the most important thing comes, uh, the, the most important thing in most meetings is said when someone's walking out, walks out the door and turns around to say something. That's usually they're just saying they're getting that last breath out. So these are some, some of those particularly important things. And I'm just going to shoot off, Tom, set a timer for me for 30 minutes because <laughs> I'll be I'll be quick. But I wanted to shoot off real quick some things that I have found very helpful. First off, when you're having conversations, whether it be with employees, because, again, we're talking about our, our reputation, our brand, building influence, the like factor. Um, by the way, there is a great uh book out there called the like switch and there's the like switch l-i-k-e switch and there's another one called never eat alone and it looks at all these psychological factors like proximity and we we can look just look at basic psychology 101 how do you start to influence people and going back to um uh the book again mind blank uh that we were talking about earlier simply being around someone can cause them to like you the frequency the, the more you are around someone you just start to like them more and the uh, proximity uh, uh that that people are and i don't know if that i guess it matters in the in the virtual world because we're fairly close tom you're right now about 23 inches away from my face but, <laughs> but proximity in terms of learn in terms of um being around people in terms of living in the same neighborhood physically these are all things duration Knowing someone for a longer time can help you. And these are all interesting techniques. And if you think they're fluff, it's funny. It's not funny. It's kind of funny. It's a little bit funny. These are techniques that the FBI, that FBI agents use to turn uh, agents against their own country to become double agents. So this is really interesting stuff. And if you think it doesn't take influence to make someone become a double agent, we're going to have a talk about that later. One other thing I wanted to mention is 
take I understand out of your vocabulary. If 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 you guys can do one thing from today on, I understand it it's really in a sense dismissive. And instead say something that will matter. Say you're frustrated because or you're excited because or you wish this would have turned out the other a, a different way. It's so important and it's so effective. And quite frankly, I've seen this used, Tom, Sharon McLean is so good at this and just solidified it's effective because she she does it to me all the time in email communication. She might say, you know, whatever it is, but she does that. It's very specific. You're uh, excited because, or you're overwhelmed because she's just so good at that. And it's so effective. And even in personal relationships with kids, it's one of the most calming things because you make someone feel heard and understood. And it's no, it's a lot different than I understand, but oh man, isn't that the worst? And because how can we really understand? We can, you know, that that's a, a general thing, but just state what someone is going through. This is a really tough day to you because personal thing, or you expected to get this project off, but you ran into a lot of challenges. That can be just one of the most effective things. And again, you're getting people, you're starting to build that influence. The last thing, everyone loves when someone says the last thing I'm going to say. The last thing I'm going to say is tie, speak someone's language. Tie, find out what they're passionate in, even if it's totally unrelated. I could be talking to a client and maybe they're a huge fan of snowboarding. I I don't know anything about snowboarding. I know what it looks like. I've seen it on TV, but I can start to relate that and talk about and using analogies in that. And they start to really, really appreciate that. It's again, it goes back to what Imani reinforced that if you can make someone feel heard and understood, and Tom, you've heard me say this, I don't know, 1,043 times when I say it now, if you can allow someone to feel heard and understood without them saying a word, that's one of the most impactful things because you're talking from their perspective. The very last thing, I always leave a very last after the last, the very last thing is use silence as your friend, which I'm not doing right now. But when you're in a one-on-one conversation with someone, use silence as your friend. And active listening means you're not thinking, you're essentially not thinking about anything. You're just taking it in like you're watching a movie. Tom, believe it or not, over to you. Yeah, yeah, I always would remind people if they were in a debate with me, I can see when you're forming your next idea about what I'm saying right now, but if you're doing that, you're not actually listening to me. So I'll give you lots of time to form your next thought, but at least wait until I finished my thought. Um, Speaking of which, Nick, let's go to you. Uh, A lot of good stuff and it comes, you know, fast and furious in these discussions. Um, Kind of going back to what was in the chat about, you know, talking about being the nice guy and getting trampled over versus being approachable and how does that, you know, mean what does that mean for influence you know approachability is key uh, but I think one of the biggest things that I keep resonating with as I hear everybody talk we've talked about you know how to win win friends and influence people uh, you know whatever credit that has or or doesn't but all these things kind of come to that that genuine that authenticity that take the interest in the other person um, and remembering that you're trying to influence yes but it's not a vacuum so you are likely to be influenced by what's happening in the moment as well um, and I think one of the things that keeps coming up um, under the guise of other things is influence is very much situational awareness. If I'm, you know, at work waiting tables, I know I have authority because I probably know the menu better than the person sitting at my table, and they're going to lean on me for, hey, what's good? It's a simple question. It's a simple exercise in influence, but I can get them to go to the, you know, twenty dollar entree, or the five dollar burger, or wherever I want them to go in that situation. Um, And even, you know, quick bursts, you know, being a job seeker as well. How can I exert influence quickly through a resume, through an interview? It's that situational awareness. What is the problem that you need to solve? What is it that you really want? Um, And what ways are, you know, I can present myself as as the solution to that as well? Thanks very much for that. Uh, And Manny, let's go to you. Um, I don't know if Gary will back me up on this, but I just wanted to say uh, open-ended questions, uh, then uh, non-communication 
non verbal communication like mm, okay i hear you and then um it's all it all falls under active listening so in a kind of like had that active listening is just giving quiet there's open-ended questioning there is uh words of encouragement and now they're all under active listening so i don't know if gary will come in the one who did psychology or anyone who did psychology will come in and then back me up on that and then when we talked about vulnerability, I, and then you say you just can't be vulnerable. I just wanted to add the word, like how we say constructive feedback, I would say constructive vulnerability. So vulnerability would come in in a sense that, you know, whatever your phone, your employee is shut off and you know that situation, like situation and awareness that they've talked about, then you kind of like, you know, you know what, when I was doing that, because if you're on the top and you've also been on the um, on the on the bottom, you tell them when I was in that position, I understand exactly, you know, how you feel. Maybe you can be like, I understand exactly how you feel because when I was there, I was frustrated about this, this, and this, but this is how I went about it. You're being vulnerable, you're putting yourself a, a bit in his shoes and you're so tell, letting him know I've been there. And this is how I went about it. You're actually not even giving him advice, but you're just indirectly trying to like, you know, show him this is how I went about it. Then in his mind, he'll be like, click, okay, maybe I can also try it this way. So maybe um, I just wanted to add the word constructive vulnerability because just no, you're just not going to be vulnerable. Oh, this has, this has happened to me at home or this has happened when it's not even rele relevant in a situation. And then... Um, when you talked about proximity, Jeremy, I'll say so that's something we heard about in our pop-up, I hope pop-ups with Lee. When someone got up a situation with their with someone they were supervising, like they are clashing with them, the employee with the employee. So, like you know what? I always say proximity, you can never hate from near. We never hate from near. The more you're near somebody, even if you're so much angry, but the more they're nearer you is the more you kind of like cool down with your anger. So proximity is very important. I'll just, just want to put that out there. Um, and then also sometimes you, when you say um, you have to say what or speak out of what they're saying or wait, wait for, listen to them or ask or relate to them with, the, with their hobbies, something like that. Uh, forgive me if I'm not really rating the case. Like, I don't have to know about football for me to even make a conversation with you. I literally have callers who come in and they talk about football and I don't know anything. So I now that it's time for me to shut up and now give them the, 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 the task. Be like, no, I don't know about it. Maybe you can tell, when you tell me about it, I will, I will understand more about it. And then there they go, they tell me all that I needed it. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know about that. And then I'm giving them more, you know, I'm like motivating them to even talk more for me to pick up the points that I'll, I'll have and remember later in our relationship. So sometimes even when you don't know anything about anything and you you know, you find out, oh, they're, they're interested in football, you're not even interested in football, you let them speak. And the more they talk is that the more they're expressing themselves and the more is, and the more we talk is the more we feel like we are related to people and we are connected with people. So that's what I just wanted to say. And thank you so much. <laughs> I, I once had someone comment that I was a great conversationalist. Well, that's just because I'm asking people questions and then they talk about themselves and they really like that. <laughs> Linda Ann, let's go to you. That's absolutely true, Tom. Um, there's just a couple of uh, points that I want to make about this, and that is when you're working to build influence, if you're trying to move an organization in a certain direction or have some kind of change in um, attitude within the, the, the workforce or your team, it takes time. Right, It's not a one and done situation, and you have to really care about the people. If you're doing it as a process for, I am just going through the motions so that I can get to my end game, that's gonna be thinly veiled and people will see through that. So it's important to understand that you have to really care about the people that you're trying to influence and take the time to um, really get to know them. and. In follow up to what Jeremy was saying about the, you know, how was your weekend kind of questions, 
what's worked best for me, both in the workforce and as a parent, is to be very specific in my questions. You know, I didn't ask, well, how was school today? I asked, so did your science experiment work correctly? Or, you know, what was the best thing about your day today? Or, and when I'm talking to just anybody who has had an experience, I'll say, well, what was your favorite thing about that? Or what was the most important takeaway? Be very specific in that because that gives them a real direction to, to move in. Um, and then on the conversation on vulnerability, it may be difficult for some people in leadership or who want to be influential to be vulnerable. But understand that when you create that vulnerability with yourself, that opens the door and creates safety for others. And when it's safe for others, then you get more of the information that you need to influence. You know, you, you've mentioned, you know, because we've already previously talked about vulnerability, but also you've kind of hit on a little bit authenticity. So is it important too to be, you know, the real you when you're having these conversations? Yeah, if you're not the real you, then people people can see through it, whether they're aware of them seeing through it or they just feel uncomfortable about it and they that undermines that level of trust. Um, yeah, you have to be sincere and authentic. <laughs> Unless you're an actor, because we fake it all the time, but we're being authentic when we're faking it. It's very confusing. Dr. Martha, let's go to you. So as Linda Ann was talking, it made me think, you know, this idea about what kind of conversations are we having with people and asking more meaningful questions, right, to have a more meaningful connection. One thing that I thought of was, what is your purpose? Why do you want to influence someone, anyone, whether it's a person or a group of people? Why do you want to influence? And I think that something that needs to be considered. We haven't talked about that yet, but look, Hitler influenced an awful lot of people, right? So did Mother Teresa. So why do you want to influence people? And I think it goes back to what I said earlier about what's in it for us not what's in it for me and using we more and I less. So yes, we may be smitten with the idea of becoming influential because again, of all these influencers online, it's such a sexy thing, right? How did they do it? But in reality, why do you want to have influence over other people? Why do you want to influence anybody, whether it's in your personal life or in your professional career? So I think it really needs to start with that because if you're up to no good, please don't influence people. Not that you'll listen to me, but it makes a big difference. The why makes a big difference. It, it certainly does. And I, I, you know, I know working with executives and teaching them to become better communicators and to really connect with other people, it's often please use this for good, not evil, because you're absolutely right. We have seen incredible speakers through the centuries who, you know, they influence people and it's caused great um, wealth and great prosperity and great uh, feelings of, of credibility. It's also caused a lot of damage. Uh, Linda Ann, let's go to you. Yeah, I want to build on what Dr. Martha was saying, and that is you know, having that alignment of focus and values and purpose um, is really important so that uh, because people want to feel like they belong. So when you can align them around the same purpose, that's helpful. Um, but also it can be a two way street, right? If you're really communicating with people and you're getting them to talk to you and share information and understand where their head is and emotion is and so forth, you can be influenced as well. And so those work, the, the people who are working with you, um, if they're giving you the common information and, and so forth, it can really influence you. So it's, a, it's not just necessarily a one way street. And then just on the whole impact of, you know, say like Hitler was an influencer or something, I don't think it's the same thing. I think it's more of a directive created by fear, right? And that's a very old way of, of leadership. Um, 
And I think influencing is a participative process. It's interesting though, because I see political parties who, you know, some political parties talk about hope of the future and others talk about fear. <laughs> and it's really sort of interesting. Jeremy, to you. Oh, I was going to say, actually, let's go to Gary and then I'll close it out. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Jeremy, great topic for conversation today. You know, to um, reiterate what Brandon was saying as an external consultant and internally, too, being able to influence is absolutely, uh, if not the most important skill, it's it's in the top uh, top three. Too many times I've seen people, very smart people, have the right answer and then become totally frustrated with the fact that other people won't get on board with their with their right answer. And how many meetings have we been in where, you know, maybe because we've assessed people, we know that they are, you know, the 99th percentile of their cognitive ability and you can hear their logic and you can understand they've got the right answer, but everybody in the room is not going along with them. And then that meeting ends with you knowing that the company's going in the wrong direction. So just and so just to share with you uh, kind of what I keep in mind when I'm looking to influence uh, people, I break it down into the what and the how, and some people have already touched upon these already, but in terms of the what, I go all the way back to Aristotle, right? And so Aristotle talked about uh, ethos, pathos, and, and logos, or uh, authority, uh, emotion, and logic. And so when I'm messaging, when I'm talking, and I'm trying to influence somebody, I'm always trying to think about that balance. Am I going to try and be emotional, use use fear, for example, right, to be extreme? Am I going to try and build a logical argument? Or am I going to try to use authority and say, well, it's because I'm a, you know, I've got this background in psychology, so you should listen to me. And that leads into the next area, which is the how. The how should always focus on, hey, what's in it for me? What's in it for the person you're trying to influence? I think as, you know, human beings, as animals, that's what matters most to us. You know, how am I going to get by? How am I going to survive? I mean, it goes back to this evolutionary um, psychology idea. So uh, knowing what what motivates the person, what matters to the person, and then keeping that mix of ethos, pathos, and logos in play. Quick example, if I know an executive is really concerned about losing their job, then I'm going to present my ideas in terms of, well, here's how this is going to help you keep your job. If they're really worried about how they're being perceived, then I'm going to say, well, you know, here's how my idea is going to help you be perceived more credibly or what have you. The very last thing I want to say, I know we only have two minutes here, you know, mention was made of like, you know, Hitler and uh, um, uh, mass media influencers, I think it's very important to take a look at those instances. Uh, for me to really understand things, I like to amplify them up and minimize them all the way down. So if you crank up influence to the maximum, it becomes manipulation and, and mass manipulation. Um, and there's a lot to learn from, and that could be used for good in terms of uh, what happened in those situations. Because, I mean, it really gives you insight into um, the way humans operate and we have to be careful to balance influence with mob mentality so that was my that was my very quick summary and thanks again jeremy it's a great topic and gary thank you everyone from aristotle to modern influencers and it always <laughs> amazes me we go back to aristotle so much because he was a really smart guy um, and jeremy let's go to you next because um you know it's kind of interesting that Next week's topic really sort of blends into our discussion today because it's going to be workplace reputation and its risks. Yes, and if I remember correctly, Destiny Preet will be with you leading that one for next week. So again, all falling into our theme of thought leading workplaces. So that's bound to be an exciting one as well. Tom, how about this? How about listening to Gary? You'll you appreciate this because you're the voice and speech guy. I mean, talk, some what we haven't talked about today is sorry, Gary, to put you on the spot in a good way. Is just the it factor. So, like a calming voice, so rational, just pulls you in, and you can see the like the movie that's playing in in, in his head, and it's just the, this draw of influence. So, what, me? Uh, you talking about? You talking about me? Yeah, yeah. Whether you know it or not, I'm telling you. So, <laughs> I, I appreciate the compliment, but I am using the influential Zoom filter, so maybe that is what. <laughs> And that's perfect because the last point I wanted to make, as Gary uses a little bit of humor, this is a perfect segue. I told you he was a natural. Is just a little bit of uh, some of these findings. And I know we're out of time, but are we really ever out of time? So it goes without saying. So uh, I, this is one of the other articles. Followers tend to view, view, view leaders who use humor as being more 
relational and effective. Wow, this is a finding from 2018. And uh, also, so there's a lot of encouraging findings about the positive impacts of leader using humor. It, it goes without saying, it's one of those psychology things where you need a study for that. Well, you do, because it also gets into some other things. Positive humor, positive attributes can help the workplace and create a lot of cohesion within a team. Obviously, aggressive humor, sarcasm, that kind of stuff is detrimental to the team. So if you're going to use humor, use it appropriately. Also, one of the takeaways from the study is if you're looking to hire leaders, try to find leaders that are going to be able to uh, that are able to more easily connect with and you can kind of tell during the interview process that they're going to be effective in that that type of behavior. So just a, an interesting takeaway that, yes, the use of humor can be good and it actually shapes followers social value. I'm reading verbatim here and further may further motivates employees to contribute their energies to the benefit of the work group when affiliative humor, in other words, positively intended humor are used. And then the one of the last points, so we talk about influence and it's important to notif- notice the difference between influence and what some people may sometimes think of when I have these conversation as manipulation. So I think about it as manipulation in terms of, let's think about it if you're going to think about that in terms of how a chiropractor manipulates the spine. You're just changing the spine to make it better. Influencing, we're talking about leading people and conversations to a place better than where they were headed before. And that takes away the any, any type of manipulative, and it all comes back to the person. So yes, uh, you meant we mentioned the topic for next week. Great. Again, if you're struggling to find uh, your career in IO, if you're struggling in that direction, check out our, our IO Career Pathfinder program. If you're a university with an IO psychology or applied psychology program, and you're looking to augment that with support for your students, check us out at cbock.com where it says four universities. And for businesses, if you're looking to access any of us for coaching or consulting any of our expert members, you know where to find us as well. Love this. What a great one to start off with the 2023. Until next time, we'll see you next week. Counting out in five, four, three, two, and one.